Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Monday, November 28th, 2022. Congress returns from the holiday break for a busy lame duck session that will include taking up a federal spending bill to avoid a government shutdown in three weeks. Also possible on the agenda, raising the debt ceiling, gun legislation, electoral reform, the National Defense Authorization Act, and codifying the right to same-sex marriage. Coming up, we'll hear from Senate leaders and the Washington Bureau Chief of the Christian Science Monitor. Just over a week until the Georgia Senate runoff election, Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, newly re-elected himself, today talking about election integrity and democracy. White House asked about the anti-COVID lockdown protests happening in China, a rare challenge to that country's authoritarian leaders. Back in the U.S., Supreme Court hearing oral arguments in a case asking when someone not in government but in a position to influence government can be charged under federal corruption laws with accepting bribes. And at the White House again, First Lady Jill Biden presenting this year's holiday decorations. The theme is, she says, we the people. This from CBS News. Lawmakers are returning to Washington this week for the final sprint before the end of the 117th Congress. And the House and Senate face a laundry list of legislative items before the year's end, ranging from a must-pass bill to keep federal agencies operating to a plan to reform how Congress counts electoral votes. The Senate was back today following the Thanksgiving break. House returns on Tuesday. C-SPAN, as always, covers the House and Senate live, gavel to gavel. The House on C-SPAN television, the Senate on C-SPAN 2. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat from New York, speaking about what the next few weeks will bring, especially that government funding bill. Once the Senate passes respect for marriage, there's a lot on the to-do list that we must cross off before the end of the calendar year. Chief among them, of course, is working together to fund the government by December 16th. Failure to act by then will result in a pointless and painful government shutdown, right as the holiday season kicks into high gear. The best option for avoiding a shutdown, of course, is for Republicans to work with us on an omnibus ensuring the federal government is fully prepared to serve the public in the next fiscal year. A continuing resolution, on the other hand, is far less desirable for many reasons. A CR would cause grave harm to our troops in uniform at a time when national defense is critical. With Russian aggression in Europe and China's aggression in the Indo-Pacific, the last thing we can afford right now is to turn government funding into another political tit-for-tat. Government funding should rise above politics when the well-being of our troops and our national defense is on the line. Just this morning, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin wrote to congressional leaders explaining why a CR is the wrong solution for national defense. It will not only cost our military billions every month, it will also freeze new investments in critical military infrastructure. It will mean many staffing and personnel decisions will be put on hold. When we see some of the advances some of our competitors, China and Russia, have made in military equipment, we can't afford to sit still. That's what a CR would do. We would just sit still as others gain on us. As China continues to dial up its saber rattling over Taiwan, a CR will doom the Department of Defense's hopes of beginning new strategic initiatives in the Indo-Pacific region. To quote Secretary Austin, we can't outcompete China with our hands tied behind our back three, five, or six months every fiscal year. He's absolutely right. I hope my Republican colleagues are listening. The best, gift, kind of, the best gift Congress can give our troops is uniform certainty, is, is in uniform is certainty, certainty of resources, certainty of purpose, and certainty that Congress will act to give our military service members the tools they need to keep us safe. The only way that will happen is by Congress working together to pass an omnibus bill in the coming weeks. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor. The temporary government funding bill runs through December 16th. A full-year omnibus spending bill would finish out the rest of the fiscal year, which runs through the end of September of 2023. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky also speaking on the Senate floor today about government funding, and he says how it relates to inflation. This year, for too many families, Thanksgiving also brought added stress and anxiety. 
two years of ruinous inflation that have pushed up the cost of everything from food to travel to housing to home heating and electricity. In January 2021, with inflation well within a normal range, President Biden and this all Democratic Party government took power, talking a big game about rebuilding the middle class. Instead, they promptly set out eroding away the ground from right underneath middle class families' feet, taking a match to trillions of dollars and igniting the worst inflation in 40 years. On President Biden's watch, the average American household is paying an extra $110 a month on food, an extra $111 on housing, $270 more on transportation, and $147 more on energy. That's more than $750 in hidden Democratic inflation taxes for the average household. Thousands of extra dollars per family per year because Washington Democrats jumped headlong into party line reckless spending that every expert and every Republican warned, warned would hurt our country. All in all, prices have soared by 13.9% since President Biden put his hand on the Bible. Thanks to his party's reckless spending, inflation is the highest it's been since the fallout of the Carter administration. So it's no wonder this was painfully costly Thanksgiving. Staples from turkey to potatoes to green beans have seen double-digit price increases in just the past year. Inflation, literally on top of inflation. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell on the Senate floor, first day back for the Senate since the Thanksgiving holiday break. C-SPAN spoke to Linda Feldman, Christian Science Monitor, Washington Bureau Chief, about the post-election lame duck congressional agenda. There's just a pile of work left to get done in the last, what are we here, five weeks or so, four weeks. Right. What are top priorities? Well, the first thing is keeping the government funded. So the, the last continuing resolution went through December 16th. They have to keep, they have to fund the government, whether that's through another continuing resolution or a, a big omnibus spending bill remains to be seen. Uh, there's talk of kicking it down the road another uh, week to the 23rd, but I think uh, members might be looking at staying here right until Christmas, if not through Christmas. When did they, so they, they have this deadline that they set uh, a couple of months ago, but mm -hmm. this is for spending for the current fiscal year That's we right. are in. Um, is there any possibility that would slip and they'd kick it further down the road into the 118th Congress? I doubt it because the 118th is a completely new ball game. We'll have a divided government, so the Republicans won the House by a narrow majority. Uh, Democrats have the Senate uh, either another tie or uh, a one, one vote majority, depending on how the runoff goes in Georgia on December the 6th. But main thing, uh, Republican majority in the House, and that means uh, a whole different calculus on trying to pass anything. There are stumbling blocks, however, in that, in that um, omnibus spending bill, the mm -hmm. annual spending bill, including having to raise the, the debt ceiling, potentially being tagged on to that spending bill. Right. What else are you looking at? So in terms of uh, other, so we need to, the, the National Defense Authorization Act, Authorization Act needs to go through that funds our defense capabilities, extremely important. Uh, other things coming up in the lame duck, uh, Respect for Marriage Act, uh, which is an effort to lock in same-sex marriage and also interracial marriage. They've added that. This is an offshoot from the Dobbs ruling, which overturned Roe v. Wade on abortion. Right. Uh, so that, I think, is a top priority. Uh, additional funding for the war in Ukraine, which is can be a little tricky, but because some Republicans and even some Democrats are now saying, wait a minute, why are we spending so much money in Ukraine when we have so much need in this country? Uh, so, yeah, a lot going on. Is there, that for that request from the White House, that $38 billion right. request from the, well, the White House, is there a chance that might, net, might not get done by the lame duck, lame duck session? It's possible, but, you know, Nancy, Nancy Pelosi is speaker still, and she, this is her swan song. She is capping off 20 years as the leader of the Democrats, whether as speaker or minority leader, and she is a leader uh, with no peer. 
in terms of uh, shepherding and corralling her caucus. She's got a wide range of views within her caucus, including the the, the upstart uh, progressives who want to pu have, have pushed the party to the left and want to keep doing that. But Nancy Pelosi enjoys a lot of respect, and especially since she, now she's stepping down from party leadership in the House, I, I think we'll watch her in action and watch her uh, get a lot done. We're talking about the the lame duck session first, but also what's ahead in the 118th. You had a recent piece not long after the election um, that the headline of which said, after midterms, does anybody have a mandate? And you talked to a number of people, Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. independents. You talked to people like Jason Grumet at the Bipartisan mm -hmm. Policy Center, right. the former White House Press Secretary, Ari Fleischer. And mm -hmm. what was your sense in that, in that article? What's your takeaway for the word for a mandate? Is there a mandate? So there kind of isn't. The, the, the sort of the sense out of the midterms was that the Democrats won, which they actually didn't. But the <laughs> so Republicans won control of the House, and they didn't. But they didn't win a red. They didn't win a red wave. They didn't take a huge majority as in past midterms from first-term presidents. So uh, they, the, the Democrats beat expectations, and uh, the reality is that we have divided government. So the question is, what can get done in divided government? Oftentimes nothing, and sometimes nothing is a good thing. In the first two years of the Biden presidency, uh, he got a lot of stuff passed, often with votes from the Republicans. Uh, that cost the U.S. government, the American taxpayers, a lot of money. And so what we're looking at, I think, is a lot less spending mm. in the second two years of Biden's term. And, and actually, the markets liked that. You, you saw that when Republicans locked in control of the House, the markets went up because of inflation. So there's a, there's a positive way. What I liked about talking to Jason Grumet and Ari Fleischer is that they're both optimists. We saw a lot of, a lot of stuff can get done uh, with the other party, with uh, a lot of bipartisanship can take place even when uh, control of a house is very narrow. Next time, next, next two years, Maybe not so much. Yeah, where where are the the both wings of both parties in terms of those moderate members that mm -hmm. uh, problem solvers caucus, if you right. will, even the unofficially people who aren't members of where what is, what does it look like for the 118th? So they'll have a lot of a lot of uh, sway. Every you know we tend to look at the loudest voices or hear the loudest voices, whether it's in the Senate with Joe Manchin or uh, in the House with the the young progressives who are wanting to do a lot. But the reality is that with a small majority in both houses, any group, any even small interest group, can make can 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 demand attention because they can they're majority killers. So I think it'll be interesting to see in the in the next Congress who rises as the new the new voices and the existing voices who use the clout that they do have and the leverage to get what they want or block what they don't want. Uh, what are the, I want to ask you about what the numbers mean, because this is what we know so far. It's almost all decided in the House. So far, right. the New York Times here reporting 220 Republican members for the right. 118th, 213 Democrats, the two races left undecided, right. California and Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're likely to go Republican. Right. So the, say that final number is 222 to 213. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for a potential House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy? Kevin McCarthy has to channel his inner Nancy Pelosi and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and corral the votes he needs. There are already five House Republicans who are on the record saying no to Kevin McCarthy as Speaker. It doesn't mean they won't flip. It doesn't mean that, therefore, that Kevin McCarthy is not the next Speaker. There's not a clear alternative to Kevin McCarthy. What I think they're doing is using their leverage to get something to win over uh, their vote from Mr. McCarthy. Linda Feldman is with the Christian Science Monitor Washington Bureau Chief, joining C-SPAN for the Washington Journal Morning Program. Monday morning, you can find the full discussion with her archived at our website at cspan.org. President Biden said over the Thanksgiving holiday that he would try to pass a bill banning assault weapons during the lame duck congressional session ahead of the Republicans taking over next January with the new Congress when they're going to be in the majority. President Biden spoke to reporters in Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, and this followed three mass shootings in a week. The idea, the idea we still allow semi-automatic weapons to be purchased is sick. It's just sick. 
it has no, no social redeeming value. Zero. None. Not a single solitary rationale for it except profit for the gun manufacturer. Can you do anything about gun laws during a lame duck, yeah, sir? I'm going to try. What will you I'm, try and do? I'm going to try to get rid of assault weapons. During the lame duck? I'm going to do it whenever I, I got to make that assessment as I get in and start counting the votes. And Mr. President, is that that was President Biden in Massachusetts on Thanksgiving Day. He and the family now back at the White House. Congressman Andrew Clyde, Republican from Georgia, tweeting today, Last week, Joe Biden claimed that allowing law-abiding Americans to purchase semi-automatic weapons is sick. What's sick is the president's obsession with disarming our nation and dismantling our Second Amendment freedoms. More questions about gun legislation today to the White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre. And then you're going to hear a second issue brought up, raising the debt ceiling before the U.S. House turns a Republican majority in January. A couple questions about the lame duck agenda. The, the president said last week that he was going to try to ban assault weapons during the session. What does that look like? Is he making calls? Is he taking meetings on this? Is he tasked the team with working on this? And does he think that 60 votes are actually possible here? Or that's within reach somehow? So I'm so glad you asked the question, Mary, because this morning uh, when I was in the Oval Office in a meeting with the president, he actually brought this up uh, himself because he knows how uh, his comments were reported over the weekend. And he wanted to be very clear clear, and he said that, um, you know, he believes that it's important to keep this issue uh, in banning assault weapons at the front of minds of Americans. He believes that it is up, it is it is also up to him, as President of the United States, to make the case for why it is critical uh, to move forward with assault uh, assault weapons ban. And so he, he look, uh, he understands what's at stake. He wants the American people to continue to understand what's at stake. We know many communities uh, have felt this very deeply, uh, very personally. And he also believes, you know, there were families this past uh, this past Thanksgiving holiday who looked around their table and there were missing members of their family because of this gun violence, this horrific gun violence that we have seen as recently as this weekend, as recently as just uh, last week. And he believes that they deserve, uh, they deserve to, for us, for him to continue to talk about this, continue to put this out there uh, about the importance of getting this done for American communities. Uh, but again, look, we understand it's an uphill battle. We understand that this is not easy. He gets that, uh, but doesn't mean that he's going to stop fighting for it or that he's going to stop talking about it. And on one other issue, raising the debt ceiling, we've seen Republicans sort of threaten to use this as leverage to get some of their agenda items through. How, how much importance does the president place on raising the debt ceiling during a lame duck session? So, look, you know, uh, We've been clear about this. When it comes to uh, the debt ceiling, it should not it should not be used or, or, or never be a matter of political brinksmanship. Uh, we've been very clear about that. And, congr uh, you know, congressional Republicans, they passed this uh, with the last president three times. The former president, they, they passed to lift the debt ceiling three times. There's no reason why this should not be uh, happening this time around. The Congress, you know, needs to take the responsibility once again to address the debt ceiling before it expires, and they need to act sooner rather than later. Look, now that Congress is back, we we believe that uh, you know there will be more of an urgency to get this done. Uh, and uh, look, this is this is about um, you know the sooner they act, uh, you know this is about our, our economy. This will be better for our economy. So we we'll have those conversations. The president, uh, as I was asked uh, moments ago, is going to meet with leadership uh, from both uh, the House uh, from both the House and the Senate, the Democratic and Republican leadership, and uh, and certainly we'll be having these conversations. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre taking reporters' questions in the White House briefing room. One more note about gun legislation and the, that issue. The suspect in the mass shooting at the top supermarket in Buffalo, New York last May, Peyton Gendron, today pleading guilty to 15 state charges, including domestic terrorism motivated by hate, murder, and attempted murder. Peyton Gendron shot and killed 10 black people in a predominantly black neighborhood of East Buffalo that according to the indictment, it was because of the perceived race and or color of the victims. He still faces more than two dozen federal charges, some of which carry the possibility of the death penalty. It's one week and one day until the Georgia Senate runoff election between the Democratic incumbent Raphael Warnock and Republican challenger Herschel Walker. 
11 Alive in Atlanta reporting the Georgians went to the polls in big numbers over the weekend as early voting kicked off in the runoff, with black voters and the youth vote coming in particularly strong. The weekend total of 181,711 votes represents just a fraction of the vote total from the November 8th general election of 3.9 million total votes. That's under 5 percent. So early in-person voting will continue to be conducted throughout the week ending on Friday, but more votes still to be cast. A couple of new TV ads up for both candidates, both invoking the issue of character. When I think about how important this election is, I think about my son. Who do I want him to be and what kind of senator do I want representing us? Herschel Walker has shown us what kind of person he is. And honestly, it's nothing to be proud of. But Raphael Warnock is a man of faith, and for years he's been serving our community. This election is going to be close, and we can't take anything for granted. We have to show up for Reverend Warnock. I'm Raphael Warnock, and I approve this message. Character is what you do when nobody's watching. Mm Mm-hmm. And Warnock thought no one was watching when his ex-wife called police to report his abuse. And he's a great actor. And Warnock thought no one was watching when he evicted poor people from their homes. He really f***ing evicted for $119, $119. Treat me like Character is what you do. When nobody's watching, you find out who Reverend Warnock really is. I'm Herschel Walker, and I approve this message. TV ads in the Georgia U.S. Senate runoff election, which is a week from tomorrow, December 6th. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a Republican who was just reelected himself in a race that was high profile, more so than usual after all the questions of alleged voter fraud in the 2020 presidential race raised by Donald Trump and his campaign. Brad Raffensperger had a discussion today about democracy in the digital age hosted by the Knight Foundation in Miami, reflecting on the election that just happened. I think we showed that we had honest and fair elections. I know we did in Georgia, but also what you saw in some states, it took a little bit longer for them to finish their tabulation process that a lot of people don't understand how those processes work in different states. And so that's really, what can you do for voter education? But we had 17 days of early voting. We had record turnout. Uh, We had very short lines. I screenshotted on my phone. I'll show it to you later. We had average wait time at the precincts got down to two minutes in the afternoon. The longest precinct on the leaderboard at the time was 14 minutes. And then when you got to the front of the line, it was a 47 second, you know, check in time. Voters want to know that you have safe and secure elections, but they don't like lines. And at the end of the day, we then, you know, finished up at seven o'clock and we tabulated those results and it was over relatively quickly. Uh, then we audited a race, and it was actually mine. We did a risk-limiting audit at a 95 percentile. State law required 90 percent. We elevated another 5 percent just to show this is what the results were. And most of the counties didn't have one deviation in vote total. So I think we proved in Georgia that we have safe and honest elections, which is something I've been saying since 2020. And then obviously when we took office back in 2019, it was to get a new verifiable paper ballot system be able to join ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, which David Becker was instrumental in getting the states to form that so we could update our voter rolls objectively. So I'm a structural engineer. Anything we can do with objectivity, I like. But I think voters like it also because it's objective. How can you argue with facts? You may not like the facts that your candidate came up short, but here's what the facts are. And that's what we want to present to the voters. Here's what the facts are. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger on a panel today at the Knight Foundation discussion about elections and technology. C-SPAN covered the program. Find the video at cspan.org. On Wall Street today, the Dow down 497, NASDAQ down 176, S&P down 62. The headline at CNBC, stocks close lower as supply chain concerns mount amid protests in China. We'll have more on that story coming up later in this program. Also, this from UPI, Cyber Monday sales expected to break records after Black Friday sales top $9 billion. Data from Adobe Analytics shows that consumers are expected to spend between $11.2 billion and $11.6 billion on Cyber Monday making it the biggest online shopping day of the year and of all time. Washington Today continues in a moment. Live Tuesday on C-SPAN Radio at 10 a.m. Eastern. 
The Supreme Court hears a case on immigration policy. The state of Texas is challenging the Biden administration's policy of deporting illegal immigrants who pose a threat to national security, public safety, and border security. Hear the oral arguments in the Supreme Court case U.S. v. Texas, live Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern on C-SPAN Radio and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. You can also ask your smart speaker to play C-SPAN Radio. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you get your podcast, and on the free C-SPAN Now mobile app. A few more headlines. Former White House counselor to former President Trump, Kellyanne Conway, meeting with investigators from the U.S. House Select Committee investigating the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Kellyanne Conway seen entering the Capitol Hill building where the Select Committee does its depositions and interviews. She was not publicly subpoenaed by the committee and, according to NBC News, told reporters that I'm here voluntarily as she left the room during a break. And the World Health Organization says that it is renaming monkeypox to mpox after, WHO says, racist and stigmatizing language online and other settings and in some communities was observed and reported to WHO. Now, the protests in China, the New York Post article on this begins, the Biden administration said Monday that Chinese protesters are right to call for an end to the draconian COVID-19 lockdowns without endorsing widespread calls for Beijing's authoritarian President Xi Jinping to resign. Videos published over the weekend showed large protests across China in the most significant challenge to Communist Party rule in more than 30 years, with crowds in the capital, Beijing, and largest city, Shanghai, chanting that President Xi should step down. We've long said everyone has the right to peacefully protest here in the United States and around the world. This includes the PRC, standing for the People's Republic of China. That was a statement attributed to the White House National Security Council spokesperson, unnamed. Well, more today on camera with John Kirby, who is the Strategic Communications Coordinator to the National Security Council. What is the White House's message, the president's message to people in China who are peacefully protesting COVID lockdowns there? And then did the topic of China's zero COVID policy come up in the president's bilateral meeting with President Xi when they met in Indonesia a couple weeks ago? They did talk about COVID uh, and the effect that the pandemic had had around the world. Uh, clearly, that came up inside the, the, the conversation. Uh, I don't know if specifically the zero uh, COVID policy was an issue of discussion, but certainly COVID was on the agenda, as you might expect that it, it would be. Um, and our, our message to peaceful protesters around the world uh, is the same and, and consistent. People should be allowed uh, uh, the, the, the right to assemble and to peacefully protest policies or laws or dictates that, uh, that they take issue with. Does the White House support uh, their, their efforts to sort of regain you know, personal freedoms in light of these lockdowns? The White House supports the right of peaceful protest. John Kirby, Strategic Communications Coordinator at the National Security Council, with reporters in the White House briefing room. He was also asked today about the U.S. Soccer Federation over the weekend on its website, briefly altering the flag of Iran to remove the emblem of the Islamic Republic. The Federation says it was intended to show support for the women in Iran fighting for basic human rights, referring to the widespread street protests which continue in that country. U.S. plays Iran at the World Cup in Qatar in uh, on Tuesday. Iran has filed a formal protest with FIFA, the international soccer governing body, the ethics committee there, and has called for the U.S. team to be expelled from the tournament. John Kirby says the Biden administration had nothing to do with the flag alteration. The U.S. men's national soccer team yeah. uh, has thrown up an image of the old flag before then, including the Islamic Republic That's symbol. Right. Um, was the, uh, does the White House have any comment on that decision? No, actually, we don't. And this isn't the kind of thing that, you would, that the White House would comment on. Uh, USA Soccer is a private entity, and they, uh, uh, they make their own decisions about those kinds of things. And uh, uh, we, wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't comment on that. We wish them all the best tomorrow. The team had said it, was cons- it, it changed the flag after consultations with various entities afterward. Are you aware of anyone in the U.S. government speaking to the team I'm about it? I'm not aware of any conversations by anybody in the U.S. government that had anything to do with their decision either to post that image uh, the, uh, previously and then to, to take it down and replace it. No. John Kirby, spokesman for the National Security Council, 
with reporters in the White House briefing room. This issue also came up at a U.S. men's national soccer team pre-match news conference. You'll hear from the Team USA coach, Greg Berhalter, and the captain, Tyler Adams. We had no idea about what U.S. soccer put out. The staff, the players had no idea. And for us, it's, again, what Tyler said, you know, our focus is on this match. And, you know, I don't want to sound aloof or not caring by, by saying that, but, you know, the guys have worked really hard for the last four years. We have 72 hours between England and Iran, and we really are just focused on, on how to get past Iran that we can go to this knockout stage of the tournament. Of course, our thoughts and um, our people, the whole, the whole country, the whole team, everyone, but our focus is on this match. Thank you, Greg. Thank Please, you. it's your turn. In the name of uh, uh, God, uh, uh, the merciful, the compassionate, I am from Mashrek uh, um, press agency in Iran. Uh, Mr. Berhalter, uh, you, uh, it seems uh, that the United States, the media, have also started a mind uh, game, an attack like that they did in uh, the, the UK. And uh, um, as Mr. Kirosh said, there is going to be to the uh, disadvantage uh, of um, the, the American team. If you take away the very sacred word of Allah from the, the flag of a country, it is disrespectful, it's an insult. And right now we see that the US Federation has also um, given a communique that they support the Iranian women. We have never seen in sports that something like this happens. So what do you think? Do you think that this movement on their part is going to be to your disadvantage or is something that is going to boost your morale? Again, you know, I can only reiterate that the, the players and the staff knew nothing about what was being posted. Um, and, it, you know, sometimes things are out of our control. We believe that it's going to be a match um, that the result will depend on, you know, who puts more effort in, who, who executes better on the field. And, you know, we're not focused on those outside things. And, and all we can do on our behalf is apologize on behalf of the players and the staff but it's not something that, um, you know, that, that we are part of. Yes, please. Hello, hi. Uh, Tyler, this question is for you. My name is Mila Javamadi from Press TV. First of all, you say you support the Iranian people, but you're pronouncing our country's name wrong. Our country is named Iran, not Iran. Please, once and for all, let's get this clear. Second of all, um, are you okay to be representing a country that has so much discrimination against black people in its own borders? And uh, we saw the Black Lives Matter movement uh, over the past few years. Are you okay to be representing the US? Meanwhile, there's so much discrimination happening against black people in America. My apologies on uh, the mispronunciation of your country. Um, yeah, that being said, you know, there's discrimination uh, everywhere you go. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned, especially from living abroad in the past years and uh, having to fit in in different cultures and, and kind of assimilate into different cultures, um, is that in the U.S. we're, we're continuing to make progress uh, every single day. You know, growing up for me, I was I, I grew up in a in a white family with an obviously an African American heritage and background as well. So um, I had a little bit of uh, different cultures, and I, I was very very easily able to assimilate in different different cultures. So um, you know, not everyone has that that ease and uh, the ability to do that. And obviously, it takes longer to understand. And through education, I think it's it's super important. Like you just educated me now on the pronunciation of of your country. So. Um, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a process. I think as, as long as you see progress, uh, that's the most important thing. Thank Tyler Adams is captain of Team USA. You also heard from the head coach, Greg Berhalter, at the World Cup soccer tournament or football tournament in Qatar today. This is Washington Today. U.S. Supreme Court heard oral arguments in cases challenging the public corruption conviction of a one-time top aide to former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo and others in an upstate New York economic development project known as the Buffalo Billion. Bloomberg News explains that Justice questioned whether Joseph Prococo could be convicted of so-called honest services fraud 
given that he was working for Governor Cuomo's re-election campaign and not the government during a key eight-month period in 2014. The Biden administration is defending the conviction. Here's some of the oral argument with Justice Samuel Lito questioning Jacob Roth, attorney for Joseph Prococo. What do you think needs to be shown to establish an agency relationship? Uh, let me give you this example. Uh, suppose there is a situation in which the person who formally holds official power doesn't exercise it, and everybody knows that. So suppose it's a, uh, a popular governor who cannot run for re-election again, but the spouse of the governor runs. And everybody knows that the former governor is really the one pulling the strings. Everybody knows that. And if anybody asks the person who is, holds the office as a formal matter, that person will say, don't bother me with this, just ask uh, my spouse. Would that be, would that person uh, be, could that person be convicted under the statute? Your Honor, I think that there's room to have a, a disagreement about what level of of uh, evidence would allow a jury to infer an agency relationship. And maybe on those facts, I think a jury potentially could say, look, in that situation, the spouse has assumed the role of an agent. She understands that. He understands that. Everyone else understands that. And, he, and she really is exercising the power as an agent. However, in this case, we know the government cannot be relying on an agency theory because the government had a count that depended on agency. Section 666 on its face says, agency, and the jury acquitted Prococo on that case. Well, I, I understand that, although uh, I don't know whether it's necessary for a jury's uh, verdict on all counts to be consistent, that you have to read them as being consistent. But putting the, the facts of the case aside, and of course I know that's what's all important to you, but we need to articulate the correct legal principle. Right. And I thought your argument was that uh, we should draw a bright line. Either you have the formal power or you don't. You've taken the oath of office. You're in office. If you haven't done that, you can't be convicted. But now you seem to be buying into at least some aspects of the Second Circuit's idea that someone can be functionally a, an official. Your Honor, I, I think we've always said official employee or agent. But the key point is that even an agent has been delegated authority to act on behalf of the principal. It may be uh, not through a written contract, it may be not through holding an office, but there is a delegation when you have an agency relationship. And I don't think we've ever suggested that that's not enough, but that's not what the Second Circuit's decision is all about. Second Circuit's decision is about reliance and control, which is not about delegating power, it's about exercising influence, and that doesn't distinguish a situation like our case from a really influential lobbyist. Jacob Roth, in the oral argument, Prococo v. U.S., questioned by Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. Representing the federal government, Nicole Reeves, assistant to the Solicitor General. Here's a question by Justice Clarence Thomas. Counsel, what is curious about this case is that the state of New York doesn't seem to be upset about this arrangement. Justice Thomas, I'm not sure that the fact that New York hasn't prosecuted him, um, particularly when there has been a federal prosecution, suggests that the state of New York finds any problem with what he did. And as indicated in our brief, New York public law appears in, in two different places, both its ethics law and its public servant law, appears to prohibit petitioner's conduct. Its bribery statute closely tracks the language of Section 201, which indicates that he did commit bribery under state law as well, even if the state decided not to prosecute him. But doesn't that work against you? It, it suggests that if New York uh, actually wanted to prosecute it, uh, this uh, activity, it had the... Uh, authority to do so and the statutory basis for it. That a state could prosecute someone for a federal crime doesn't suggest that the federal no, statute No, I don't think that's valid. the problem that, that I'm pointing to. Um, rather that it's rather odd that uh, this broad federal prosecution is taking place under what some have termed a, ca termed a catch-all provision. Uh, is being used rather than the sp specific state law that you suggested? Again, 
I don't think that this court has ever suggested that the existence of potentially overlapping federal and state statutes, even if one is broader than the other, um, means that we shouldn't that the court shouldn't interpret the federal statute to the full extent. No, it, I think my has. point is rather that it seems as though we are using a federal law to impose ethical standards on state activity. I think that was always part of what Section 1346 was intended to cover. Um, the development of the honest services fraud doctrine started in the 1940s, and this court stopped that with McNally in the 1980s, and Congress reinstated that doctrine by using this text. And as this court noted in Skilling, most of the prosecutions that occurred under the pre-McNally theory were of public officials. Nicole Reeves, assistant to the Solicitor General, questioned by Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in the case Percoco v. U.S. Joseph Percoco was an employee of former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's re-election campaign. There was a second case today, Simonelli v. U.S., and that refers to Buffalo developer Louis Simonelli. Associated Press article summarizing the both the oral arguments in both cases writes, the cases are the latest in which the high court could narrow the use of federal fraud charges against state and local officials, as well as people doing business with governments, even if those interactions appear to be unsavory. First Lady Jill Biden unveiling this year's White House holiday decorations alongside the leadership of the National Guard and their families and thanking the over 150 volunteers who spent the time decorating the public rooms of the White House. First Lady says the theme this year is We the People, and each room has its own theme within a theme. Room by room, we represent what brings us together during the holidays and throughout the year. The gold star trees honor and remember those who laid down their lives for our country and the families who carry on their legacies. In the library, we celebrate how the stories we share bring us closer to each other, our history, and the world around us. In the Vermeer Room, we honor how the smallest acts of kindness and appreciation really do matter. In the China Room, we remember family traditions passed down at dinner tables full of laughter. In the East Room, where we are right now, we highlight the national treasures that belong to all of us, the national parks and the communion we find in nature. So you can see them on all the mirrors if you look around you. All the national parks are celebrated. And in the green room, bells of all kinds remind us of the healing and unifying power of music. In the red room, we know that in times of both joy and grief, Faith can light the way. And in the state dining room, we honor the promise of the next generation and see the holidays through the eyes of children. And in the blue room, the official birds of all 57 states and territories and of our nation's capital are woven together to transform the 18-foot Christmas tree into a stunning symbol of unity. Wasn't that tree, like, so magnificent? <laughs> First Lady Jill Biden at the White House unveiling the annual holiday decorations. Some more details from CNN. There are 77 Christmas trees throughout the White House with over 83,000 holiday lights that decorate the trees, garlands, wreaths, and displays. The annual White House Gingerbread House includes 20 sheets of sugar cookie dough, 30 sheets of gingerbread dough, 30 pounds of chocolate, and 40 pounds of royal icing. And also this year, a menorah created by the Executive Residence Carpentry Shop is being added to the holiday decorations. The menorah was constructed using wood removed from the White House in the 1950s during the Truman renovation. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get the stories Washington is talking about sent to your inbox every day. You can subscribe at c-span.org forward slash connect. Have a good night.